uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Wang Kang Wu, who hardly needs any kind of introduction given the breadth of his scholarship and the uh, many generations of scholars that his work has influenced. Uh, it is also with um, great warmth and grateful memories that I chair his keynote address because, and he may not uh, remember this, he was the chair of the very first panel where I delivered a, my very first paper as a graduate student many eons ago, about a quarter century ago, I think. And he was kindness personified, uh, went out of his way to calm the nerves of a rather inexperienced and anxious sort of student. So time has obviously not stood still, um, and uh, it's uh, with a sense of awe that I think that he's, he's uh, well, he's obviously there, and I've sort of moved on a little bit, but it's still with this great sense of awe that I find myself chairing uh, Prof Wang's keynote. Let me first give you a highly condensed version of his CV, just to provide that little prelude, I mean, uh, before we hear from Prof, Prof Wang, himself, and also to give some time to people uh, streaming in to the conference. As well as being Emeritus Professor of the Australian National University, Professor Wang is currently University Professor at the National University of Singapore. While he has traversed many countries uh, in his academic career, Singapore features prominently at a number of the turning points of his very illustrious career. Professor Wang started with us and he received his BA and MA from the University of Malaya in Singapore and his PhD from the University of London. He was then Professor of History at the University of Malaya again and then Professor of Far Eastern History and Director of the Research School of the Pacific Studies at the ANU. From 1986 to 1995, um, this was when he was not with us, he was actually with uh, Hong Kong as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong before he then returned to the fold back to Singapore. In Singapore, he's chairman of the ISIS Yusuf Isha Institute, the East Asia Institute, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at NUS, and many others that I won't have time to elaborate on. Uh, beyond Singapore, he is fellow and former president of the Australian Academy of the Humanities, commander of the Order of the British Empire, and for an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and, so and, and Sciences. His publications are too numerous to mention. Let me just point to his recent books, and these include Wang Kangwu, Educator and Scholar, that's edited by Cheng Yunnian and KK Pua uh, in 2012, Renewal, The Chinese State and a New Global History in 2013, and another China cycle committing to reform in 2014. Even more recently, Prof Wang's Dialogues on World History were edited by Wiki Bing and published as The Eurasian Core and Its Edges in 2015. The launch was fairly recently. Prof Wang will now speak to us on the topic of heritage and history in the context of Singapore. Prof Wang, please. Friends and colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I, I wish to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to speak at this conference. The National Heritage Board has been very active in alerting the people of Singapore to the need to protect their cultural heritage and artifacts. And there are many different communities here in Singapore, and you know that, the Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others, and each has heritage that deserves our close attention. The conference organizers have asked me to talk about uh, Chinese communities and their heritage. Now this is a huge subject, uh, but because heritage comes from the past, Take I propose... This. Thank you. I propose to concentrate on its complicated links with history. The Chinese, like other communities, see their heritage as the living past in their lives. And this can be traced to their migratory traditions in this region, and for some also to their 
ancestral homes in China. Thus, heritage consists of what people practice, what they respect, including what they're learning from past experience. And to understand that, the people need to know their history. Cultural heritage is often taken for granted, and people need to be reminded that to understand its importance in their lives, we do need to make the effort. For some 50 years, experts at UNESCO have helped the world to think of heritage sites and practices as part of the heritage of humankind. Now, these experts are people who have a strong sense of history, and we are thankful that they have so greatly enriched our lives. <clears throat> In particular, protecting heritage has improved our understanding of what is being lost and forgotten. That success reminds us that familiarity with history is essential if we are to appreciate that what heritage means. For my talk, I shall focus on heritage that continues to influence the lives of Chinese communities outside as well as inside China. Modernity and globalization have softened the differences among the peoples in Asia, but distinctive attitudes towards heritage still remain. Singapore is no exception. The multiple cultures of its peoples are separate, if not at, all, if not at odds with one another. The island's brief past since independence has led people to identify with values that make them modern, both modern and global. Now that has led to setting high educational goals aimed at ensuring material success. But the city-state has for decades paid little attention to the study of history. This serious neglect has made it harder now for younger generations to appreciate their heritage here. A growing number of activities, act, activists have been doing their best to correct this for some time, and many of them are present at this conference, and I will leave it to them to, to tell us what has so far been achieved. Singapore is a city with a high level of cultural complexity. That's pretty obvious, I think. The heritage here, therefore, includes experiences that impact on a variety of people living here and that still has, can make a difference to their lives. To me, heritage is the expression of relationships between people and their past and includes those that are tangible as well as those that are intangible but nevertheless alive. And to, illust to illustrate this, let me take an example of how Chinese people engage their past differently from those, let us say, of uh, the Mediterranean civilization. In the Greco-Roman tradition that evolved in Europe, it was important for the Parthenon in Athens to be authentic, even if the original is in ruins. In comparison, in China, buildings on temple sites are often rebuilt and not valuable in themselves. It does not matter that the original was destroyed. What counts is the relationship of people to that site. And as long as the site is sacred in their eyes, the buildings on it are a valuable, a valuable heritage. The intangible idea of sacredness here produces very tangible heritage. The Chinese people have never been a single community or a nation state. They inherited a, a, a cultural complex that is the product of centuries of mixtures and integrations, one that never stopped adapting to changing circumstances and to new challenges. The Chinese leaders recognize that there are varieties of historical artifacts, some to care for and others to be put aside. And some see this heritage flowing from miscellaneous sources into one great reservoir. 
and thus picking through different facets of China's historical experiences can be very rewarding, very confusing as well, and very difficult to sort out, you can imagine. In Southeast Asia, most Chinese are descendants of those who left China during the past two centuries, and came from different towns and villages, in primarily in two southern provinces, those of Fujian and Guangdong. Until the end of the 19th century, these men left home in pursuit of trade or in, in search of work. Their homes were far from the centers of power in north, northern China, and they had a sense of belonging to small communities with distinctive cultural values. Their xiang tu wen hua, these are very local cultures. The bonds of beliefs, rituals, and practices brought with them could be modified if necessary to serve their enterprises and to protect their lives. Whatever they could, they gathered together with kinsmen from the same districts who spoke the same dialect. They built temples or shrines that gave them an added sense of security and identity. And when their groups became larger, they organized other bodies to represent their needs and expand their common interests. Let me take one example for, of the adaptability from their use of surnames. The Chinese were the first people to use the surnames of male heads of households to bolster the, the power of elite families. One could not find a more prominent example than that of the House of Confucius. And from the latest figures I've seen, they're now onto their 77th generation, and um, they number, if, they, if I, they, they are correct, they number something like two million descendants with the surname Kong, formally recognized as part of the Kong lineage. Uh, that's the largest, that I probably the largest known. And uh, of course, the use of surnames are projected in all directions and uh, involve whole imperial houses, dynastic system itself is based on what we call families running the empire, the jia tian xia, the family empire, the dynastic line. So that alone represents this uh, use of surnames and the imperial surnames became very prolific because they either had lots and lots of children or they bequeathed their surnames to valued supporters and loyal followers of the regime. So these surnames are very prominent and that's pretty well known. Uh, just to add to from the sublime to the ridiculous, the latest version of how a surname can be flexibly used is when uh, Tsai Ing-wen was uh, elected president of Taiwan as you know, she's the first Chinese woman to be so elected. But in addition to that, she's single and um, with no husband or children, of course. And so the problem, problem of this, this finding out who should be the first husband or first man or first lady uh, became of interest to the people in Taiwan. And they decided that since she loves her cat so, so much, her cat is called Xiang Xiang. So they've now renamed the cat as Chai Xiangxiang, named after with her surname. So that's, that's how flexible the Chinese can become. But let me just go back to the subject. Over the centuries, the, the practice spread, this practice of using surnames in that way, spread to other social groups and enabled them all to identify with their ancestors and strengthen lineage cohesion. The Confucian scholars and officials recognize this kind of lineage as one linkage as one of the central features of social and institutional continuity. With this inclusive relationship, people could connect with others who came from localities far apart. Same surname genealogies were used to bind them together for, as descendants of real or imaginary ancestors and establish cooperative networks. And this applies right through the country. It's not limited to any part of China, any province or town, but all over China where the surnames can be found. The practice became widespread since the Song Dynasty a thousand years ago. People soon learned uh, 
to be creative to establish new and useful relationships in this way. The Chinese have other forms of association, most commonly those based on dialect groups that shared local gods from the same district. They knew how to use these bodies to help their multiple operations. The different organizations often overlapped, and most Chinese belonged to more than one group. Where the surname associations were concerned, uh, are concerned, what is remarkable is that while the retention of one's surname is tangible, the idea of surname bonding, whether the kinship was genuine or fictional, is, is not. That idea could be used to modify the terms of kinship even where there is no evidence of blood ties or any credible descent lines. Surname identification is thus extended to strengthen the range of social and economic activities. It also enables smaller groups to rearrange themselves to stand up to the more powerful surnames. Uh, as you know, there are something like uh, 5,000 surnames. I know there's a thing called 100 surnames, but that's uh, only a very small part of it. There are probably altogether something like 5,000 surnames in China today. For 1.4 billion people, that's really not that many. But really, the large bulk of the surnames, something like uh, 100 of them, would be the surnames of about 90% of the Chinese population. I have only about 100 surnames. And the first uh, 20 or 30 are probably not something like half the population of China. So there, the, there's lots of common surnames, and therefore some very powerful clans based on the same surname, like Confucius, an extreme example, but many more with very common surnames. But there are many, many others with very small surnames, and very few of them. And they sometimes regroup or group themselves, finding some way of uh, and enabling them to do so, and then thus form big enough groups to stand up against the larger, powerful surnames. This idea of surnames, of course, is, is portable. It travels easily with most Chinese. It can overcome barriers of locality and sub-ethnic identity, identity to crea create another set of networks. Surname bonding does not need to be externally validated or conserved because it works even when P Chinese are far away from their home homeland. In this world, uh, this modern world of, uh, the not modern and global world today, this heritage may not be as effective as in the past, but it remains an ingenious way of using the idea of surnames to extend the basis for practical relationships. This is but one example of intangible heritage being adapted for use outside China to support the kinship levels of operation, serving as a kind of pre-modern NGO, so to speak. There are other kinds of organizations that have the capacity to function widely outside their original environment and can be used to build networks to reach out to different countries, to even to different continents. What is more, this heritage is also useful for Chinese today, Chinese in China today, who extend their operations overseas. And those who deal with foreign Chinese, the Chinese foreign nationalities, seeking to do business in China. And the awareness of its value comes from a sharp sense of living history. My second example comes from officialdom and concerns the heritage on the sphere of moral and competent administration. This heritage derives from the idea of a golden age when the ruler-subject relationship was based on having wise, caring, and just rulers. That ideal became central to what Confucius taught when he set out to help governors rule to govern well, rulers to govern well. And over the centuries, with increasing literacy among the people, this ideal percolated down to become part of people's dream of good rulership. Even when local officials were avaricious and emperors were very, very far away. However remote the hope, that ideal was part of a common heritage. What is surprising is to find it present among people whose distant ancestors settled outside of China. 
The early male migrants to this region married local women and their descendants settled in various parts of the region. Their families in Singapore, often identified as the Pranakan or Straits Chinese, are similar to other communities in Malaysia and Indonesia, lands that were once under Anglo-Dutch commercial and colonial influence. They developed their own brand of heritage that combined Chinese artifacts with those of the Malay world. What gives that heritage its distinctive quality are their food and dress and the mixture of customary practices pertaining to birth, marriage, and death, and the social and family relationships drawn from practices in China. The hybridity of this heritage is unique, and it has now been duly recognized in the Singapore story. Observers have been struck by the resilience of the Chinese elements in the heritage, despite the fact that these Chinese have been cut off from China for a long time and spoke Malay and others either English or Dutch and very little Chinese, if at all. The way the males settled and learned to identify with local elite life is an extraordinary story. In the straight settlements under British rule, they were proud to demonstrate their intertwined cultural preferences and even their allegiance to British imperial splendor. No doubt many of them had good reasons to be grateful for the opportunity to prosper outside China. But their adaptations remind us that most Chinese during the rule of the Qing dynasty, that's the latest dynasty, the last dynasty, felt no commitment to Manchu authority in China. They largely depended on their own resources, including what they believed was admirable in their ancestral culture. Over time, what emerged among them was a newfound respect for the effective way the British governed their colonies. In particular, they were won over by the British idea of an open trading world in which colonial laws could give them a fair chance to develop their businesses. By this, I do not mean that they admired colonial rule itself or its capitalist ideology or the racism and cultural superiority that came with it. Their respect was for predictable and orderly governance and it was enhanced by their appreciation of an environment in which the merchant was not looked down upon. The response of these Chinese marked a willingness to identify with the heritage of good governance. It came from their profitable experiences with British officialdom, but interestingly, it also drew from values that were injected into the model of the Confucian merchant that they were taught to admire. This model, of course, derived from Confucian ideals in China that were finally, uh, finally became orthodox about a thousand years ago, great, put, put, placing great emphasis on the three relationships of ruler, subject, father, or parents, children, uh, husband and wife, and the, the ideals or the, the um, principles of uh, virtue, righteousness, respect for appropriate behavior, and, uh, and also, also uh, respect for education and knowledge, and finally, not least, the idea of uh, trust, which in particular, that was particularly significant for the merchant classes of China, the element of trust. And all these added together was the, the major uh, thrust, the major key, as it were, to good governance, as they understood it. Now, this model had become prominent in China during the 16th century. It gained acceptance when educated people no longer shunned those merchants who publicly accepted the supremacy of classical Confucian doctrine. It was a development that merchants in China applauded, and successful merchants made every effort to conform to its demands. Significantly, those who settled in the Nanyang in Southeast Asia were familiar with that model. They adapted it to apply to their relations with local rulers, wherever appropriate, as in Vietnam or Siam or Java, and certainly did so in their relations 
with the Dutch and British colonial authorities. And this was invaluable when the model helped them to demonstrate their familiarity with classical Chinese elite culture, and it helped them gain a degree of respect from the European counterparts with whom they did business. This is particularly true of the successful merchants, particularly among the straight Chinese who were the most successful of the, all the Chinese in the early years of Singapore. In Singapore, the adjustments made by various Chinese communities to satisfy the government methods of the straight settlements were constantly evolving to meet the rapid changes that were occurring since the middle of the 19th century. As large numbers of newcomers arrived from China, as advances were made in global maritime transportation, and as China underwent political and social revolution, these Straits Chinese had to find new ways to deal with the challenges. And the elite groups that emerged in the 20th century were further tested by Japanese invasion of Singapore, the defeat of the British, and after the end of, the World, War, of World War II, by decolonization and the rise of nation states. By the 1950s, yet another generation of leaders had to learn from the political contests that they experienced when they fought among themselves to replace British rule in this city-state. Under those changing and variable circumstances, it is remarkable how these new elites in independent Singapore have combined key artifacts of British colonial rule with carefully selected elements of Confucian virtues and values. The mix of governance ideals depend on a number of closely related factors. For example, the building on building interfaith and multicultural relationships, on refining examination systems rooted in Chinese tradition in order to recruit quality talent, and not least on modern professional training designed for a post-colonial plural society. The application here of two distinct heritages is an example of tangible innovation. But the idea that past experiences with different origins can be mixed and adapted to drive present actions is no less imaginative. Now taken together with the multiple networking strategies brought by early Chinese immigrants that have taken root here, this governance-centered heritage has been reinforced during the past 50 years by Singapore's new developmental state. Both are examples of using past experience to cultivate new relationships. They show how Chinese outside China have been creative whenever they sought to be upwardly mobile and become modern and global. But what is also interesting is that there are signs that the mixed heritage that brought new immigrants and local-born communities together in more recent years have now become appealing to young people in China who have learned to look outward. The new generations there who experienced the disruptions and discontinui discontinuities under Maoist China are impressed by how the past can be actively present no matter where Chinese people have gone. They are beginning to see that the experience of Chinese who have settled for centuries abroad can be relevant to their ambitions in China to achieve their own distinctive modernity. The examples from Singapore Chinese lead me to turn now to China, where their heritage originated. This goes beyond kinship frameworks that uh, create new kinds of relationships and beyond the administrative models that have aroused modern expectations. To talk of heritage in China means raising questions about its store of documents and records that has long played a crucial role in shaping what became China and in still determining what and who were Chinese. The place of heritage in China has a long history. However, the idea that Chinese history is continuous has often been challenged. All the same, official historiography has systematically ensured 
that China is defined by, at least to them, an unbroken continuity. The Chinese are aware that modern Eurocentric world history has greatly impacted on the Chinese sense of their past. Now, this began at the turn of the 20th century when the country's elites discovered nationalism and internationalist communism. And that was followed by the war against Japan in 1937-45 that turned that nationalism into the new foundations for legitimacy for any Chinese regime today. Now, Chinese leaders now realize that it is one thing to inherit the mantle of an ancient civilization and quite another to build a progressive Republican nation state. They are still debating how to move towards an inclusive multicultural nation and avoid becoming an exclusive ethnic nation. In that debate, they have never failed to use the heritage of unbroken historical continuity to help them decide what they should now do. And that continuity is one in which, as I mentioned earlier on, comprises centuries of integrating and mixing different cultural traditions and artifacts and peoples and cultures together to shape what is eventual or what is now known as seen as Chinese civilization. Uh, at its base, at the base of all this debate, is a heritage of records that have been systematically selected and preserved for some 2,500 years. What holds them together is the intangible idea of shi. Shi is the word that we now translate as history, but shi is actually more than that. Uh, we, we use it, but uh, this shi, I will now call it shi history because we translate it as history, but it actually doesn't mean just history. It referred to something more than history, more than history as just times past or the writings that modern historians produce. Shi history was a name given to the large body of knowledge that began from the most ancient book of documents and the spring and autumn annals that Confucius had compiled from the records of his own state. And all the records ever since then, the totality of all the records is what they call Shi. But that kind of Shi history included all varieties of documents and commentaries concerning every aspect of government. In fact, the whole basis of how the, nation, the Chinese state was established and became large and prosperous and uh, to bear, as a bearer of uh, an ancient civilization. Now, every dynasty collected these records and documents, and together they gave shape and substance to what we call China. It was a body of knowledge that represented the collective memory of what China's rulers and, and mandarins did that it enabled their successors to ensure that the Chinese civilization state continued to thrive. This idea of Shi history thus has many facets. Now, I shall touch only on one of them, on heritage, on how heritage and history interact and why that relationship is so important to people who identify themselves as Chinese. Over the centuries, Chinese have elites, elites have tried to manage everything that they considered worth transmitting to their successors by distinguishing four different kinds of knowledge. And they eventually agreed to classify them under these four categories in the following order. First, the classics. The classics encapsulating the key principles for Chinese elites to follow, including morality, ethics, and the principles of life. Second, the Shi history as the totality of the practices of government. And third, the residual areas of practical knowledge, philosophy, religions, and others. And fourth, last, the other forms of literature and uh, collected writings. Now, throughout the 2,500 years of this tradition, the least controversial was the category of Shi history that marked the whole history of China. That was sort of taken as the essential framework of Chinese imperial or dynastic rule. Shi history was the mirror of government behind which was a deep respect for ancient ideals and models when ancestors were given a sacred place, linked up with surnames again to some extent. In a similar way, every, everybody, 
was exhorted to connect with ancestors to ensure order, order in their lives, order in their relationships, both within the family, in the imperial realm, as well as in the known world outside. And he gave rise to the ethical and political concepts that many still find relevant to China today. The importance of this history was widely acknowledged as early as the Han Dynasty, that's some 2,000 years ago. But there was never any agreement in the early times, in the early period, as to which body of ethical and spiritual texts should serve as the, as the source of all wisdom. Something like the Vedas to the, to the India, in India, or the Torah, Bible, and Quran as the holy book. The Chinese couldn't agree. After several centuries of debate, during which claims were also made for Buddhist sutras and primary Taoist texts, the Chinese finally settled for the Confucian classics. And this was in the Song Dynasty during the 12th century, some 800 years ago. The Chinese finally agreed upon them, and they became, the orth became orthodoxy during the Ming Dynasty in the 14th century. And in the 18th century, the Siku Library, the library of the four categories of knowledge, produced an imperial catalog that lists all, as it were, known works of, uh, that survived all those centuries, the so-called uh, the Emperor's Four Treasuries. By that time, the classics was recognized as supreme, the Confucian classics was recognized as supreme, followed by history, true history. That imperial catalog was soon cast aside with the end of the Qing dynasty, the end of the dynastic system. After the two revolutions in 1911 and 1949, Chinese leaders wanted to replace those classics with something modern and credible. Uh, they, there were several efforts to do that, uh, with, uh, for example, with Sun Yat-sen's The Three Principles of the People, and later with Maoist teachings, or one might be called Marxist socialism in Chinese clothing. Now, neither was successful, but there was no dispute about the position of history, this history. New generations of modern historians argued whether to adopt Marxist or nationalist historiography to rewrite the past, but they all agreed that history was the bedrock of the distinctive Chinese civilization state that they've inherited. In short, Shi history has become an overarching heritage for China and the Chinese. The very idea of China depends on continuity with that ancient past. People are Chinese because they were descended from mythical times of ancestors, and they have, been, therefore, been, they have therefore given a sacred place to ancestors. The first legendary rulers provided models of good rulership, and later lineages highlighted how such rulers had ensured the vitality of society as a whole. Some modern historians have questioned the authenticity of the records that perpetuate such uh, beliefs. And scholars in every field have mocked, made fun of the blind faith and superstition behind popular renditions of gods and sages. But the nationalist turn of the 20th century led Chinese to ask what ideals could best strengthen cohesiveness among their people. And in the end, they have resorted to new interpretations of their heritage that are not dissimilar to what their imperial and Mandarin predecessors had done before them. They have reselected, in their own way, they've reselected from what they take to be the country's collective memory in order to establish new narratives. This now includes new archaeological finds and also access to foreign archival materials. But the skeletal frame remains the one that was shaped by all those past records of Shi history from the book of documents that I mentioned earlier. Obviously, Chinese people are expected to live with a keen sense of the past. This does not mean that they have to be acquainted with the actual records and the volumes of historical interpretations. Very few people would read them. What is in their consciousness, however, 
is the idea that the past is related to their identity and linking up with that past is a duty. The heritage may be intangible, but it has constantly been replenished and revivified and unlikely to go away. Many Chinese today are aware that the heavy burden of the tangible past of monuments and artifacts can be too much of a good thing. Others feel that the past should not be allowed to stand in the way of economic development and whatever is necessary to provide modern standards of living to everyone. The rival appeal of the idea of progress is too great. Thus, there is concern to balance a useful past with the urgent need to become a prosperous country. And this has led to many contradictory moves in China. For example, historic buildings have been torn down to widen highways and replaced with multi-story offices and residences. And then reproductions of traditional houses are built in the town's edges as imitation of the, in imitation of the old structures uh, to cater to the tourist trade. Some towns have preferred authenticity and kept the old center, and then they built their new towns a few miles away and moved all their offices and shopping malls to the new towns, new centers. Uh, it is interesting to see how the Chinese sense of the past operates at several levels. For most people, respect for the past is accompanied by calculations of what parts of it are really worth keeping, while looking for practical ways to make heritage useful. At another level, faith and spiritual needs determine how they should respect the sanctity of select sites and plan their buildings to reflect that. At the level of officialdom, heritage can also be helpful if it reminds the leaders of the ideals and standards of governance that people have always longed for. At the highest level, caring for heritage could ensure that what is preserved conforms to the sense of continuity that legitimates the civilization behind the present modern state. At all levels, when there is too much past, Chinese people are pragmatic. They agree that heritage has to be selective and will be preserved only if it is meaningful and perhaps more important, usable. Nevertheless, there is awareness that a keen sense of history is essential if the heritage that they respect is not hijacked and abused. The examples above of Chinese experience with experiences with their past show that there is no clear line between what is cultural and what has direct impact on policy making and public behavior. Heritage that is rooted in cultural values does influence those in authority. It can also have economic value and help improve people's well-being. But for most people, when they see how heritage can help them relate to who they are and the way they live, they would see a place for such heritage in their lives. And this is likely to continue whether they are modern Chinese in China or a more complex mixed mix like those in Singapore and elsewhere. I began by saying how grateful we are to the efforts of UNESCO and similar bodies for their efforts to make everyone attentive to cultural heritage. I fully support that work. But we need to be reminded that there is more to heritage than looking out for things that fit a list of cultural criteria. We can see how people relate differently for, to past experiences and to ideas about their past, whether tangible or not. Singapore's Chinese are not any different. They know how to use an ancient artifact like a surname to support new dynamic relationships. Their ancestors carried their hopes for good governance out of China, and that inspired later generations to seek it also in the modern state. Today, they are sensitive to the rise of China and can see the role of history in shaping that civilization as well as a new national identity. In Singapore, heritage clearly matters. People are aware that past experiences, a past experience teaches them what works and what does not. 
Heritage also requires people to know and think about the relative value of different artifacts of their past, whether tangible or intangible. Their heritage shows, then, shows them how their ancestors innovated whenever necessary in order to survive and prosper. But it is not enough to depend on personal instincts and group activities. We must know what enables us to recognize the parts of heritage that are meaningful. For that, it is essential, it is essential to people from young and from their years at school to know their history. I have taken Chinese examples to show their links with China, where history is taught at every level and is deeply embedded, embedded in people's lives. But Singapore has its own distinctive history. It cannot afford to allow other histories to define heritage for its peoples. It is quite right to ask people to stress commonalities and not the differences. But there is no alternative to diversity here. And to respect and to respect diversity requires great sensitivity, and that can only come if people know what the differences, what the differences are and where they come from. And that will help them confront the complexities of that past. New nations cannot afford to turn, back, turn their backs on the past. It seems to me that only when they understand their heritage will they be able to imagine how they can shape a distinctive future for themselves. Thank you.